Well, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here today. And it's also a privilege, I think, that's one of the moments when I enjoy being a biomedical ethicist, because you always get exposed to new issues. I've worked in AI ethics, but not specifically in um, augmented and alternative communication. I've found you know, dealing with the issue very inspiring. So thanks for the opportunity to engage with the topic and with you all. I very much enjoyed the morning, and I'm really looking forward to the upcoming panel. And I hope you'll um, benefit, in turn, from my fresh glance on the issue as some, somebody who's really coming new to this field. Now, I could not resist trying out a Korean word. I know nothing of Korean, but I couldn't resist trying to see if this would work out. Um, can you read what it says here? Yes, thank you. It does work. <laughs> so I want to get us started with, uh, you know, providing a perspective on our personal voice as being a treasure. I will then provide a very um, kind of a high level overview of the ethical issues of augmentative and alternative communication. Um, when I heard the previous speakers, I thought what would be nice now is a deep dive, for instance, on, on BCIs, but for now what I have prepared is really more a, um, a high level overview. Um, and then I'll get to the, the dual use problem of the technology and I'll end with a note on the importance of vocabulary choices regarding identity and autonomy. So, I've taken the reference of one's personal voice as a treasure from a quote by Tristram Ingelhardt, who is a physician and disability advocate from New Zealand, and hence his expression, um, Taonga in Maori. Now he is, um, he plays a key role in the movie, we'll see this in a second, and he suffers from a specific form of a progressive muscular dystrophy that can eventually lead to an inability to speak. And he's been in a wheelchair since um, 2013 and has noticed changes in his voice in recent years. And we'll now see the movie in which he's actually, um, he, in which he's featured, sort of. This is a two minute Apple video which was launched about a year ago, and it's about a gentle giant, and he recognized Tristram Inghart. And he's lost his voice, and he's very sad about it. And there's a little girl who wants to help him find it again. The solution is, in that case, an app. And the video is an advertisement for personal voice. That's a new feature of iOS 17 that enables us to preserve and recreate um, people's own voice based on audio recordings using advanced machine learning technologies. And there are some ethical issues that immediately come to mind. Um, one is that if you watch the video, you notice it, the, the tone is very emotional, so it rises high expectations. It may actually manipulate individuals into use and suppress critical question and make everyone feel good without questioning a lot of the issues that might be deserving of being addressed more fully. And the description assures the user that speech is processed securely on device. So I think, you know, if this is on my um, iPhone, nothing can happen to it. But of course, I could still use it for scams or my iPhone can be hacked. So there are still security issues that would need to be explored. So very immediately we see there are a few issues around this topic. On the other hand, you could say, you know, personal voice might well reduce the stigma of using an ACC. Some people have avoid, um, some people avoid talking to, um, talking to such devices, and uh, uh, they avoid using the devices um, that are non-personalized because it feels kind of alien to uh, those who are listening. So it might um, improve uptake, and it might lower people's effort to listen to people with speech impairments, making it easier for them to be heard. But on the other hand, this might lead to social pressure to inc use increasingly those voice smootheners. We might in the end have less tolerance for people that speak in a funny way and, from, and frown on those who are not using augmented communication technology. 
So it's great that companies care about the autonomy of people with disability, and it's great we have those innovations, but we need a continuous effort to ensure that autonomy is in fact not compromised. And this is where an ethical analysis can be helpful. So let's take a step back and look at a list of concerns that have been raised with the EU to AAC technologies. You see here, um, there's a list of benefits, and I put those dotted lines to, in, to say there, I'm sure there are more quality of life improvement, um, empowering people, in, in, you know, helping them to regain or strengthen their autonomy, social inclusion. And then there is a list of concerns as well, the risk of physical harm or psychological harm, the question around informed consent, privacy and confidentiality, accessibility issues, but possible de-skilling or over-reliance. And we heard this um, already in um, the earlier part of this conference, you know, maybe reinforcing ableism. If everything is you know, streamlined and, and expectations are high on giving a smooth performance. Um, but it's also, um, I think what is impressive is talking about AACs, we are really talking about a broad range of technology. And I'm glad I can refer to Professor Jung's speech, oops, I'm sorry, um, Professor Jung's speech earlier um, uh, today, where she kind of explained to us the, the broad range of technologies. And I think what's also remarkable is the broad range of users. You could have clinical conditions, and I think it was Dr. Lee who spoke to that, you know, it could be locked-in syndrome, cerebral palsy, imp impaired hearing, um, autism, social anxiety, speech disorders. So you can imagine a very broad range of people to whom this would um, apply. Um, and of course, they differ all then within these conditions regarding severity and prognosis. It could be adults, it could be minors, it could be people who are, you know, have full decision-making capacity. It could also be people with compromised decision-making capacity. So this really, I think, makes this an interesting field. And it means that, of course, those benefits and concerns and risks for risks and harm need to be weighed in each case. <clears throat> now let's take um, the implement implantation of a BCI as an example. We heard um, just a few hours ago about the different forms BCIs can take, um, and they differ in, in their invasiveness. Um, so of course, the weighing of risks and benefit will depend on what kind of BCI is used. It will also depend on the clinical condition of the user. Do they have decision-making capacity? Are we talking about a progressive disease where you can make an advanced decision? So you have all the time of the world to discuss what might be ahead and what people might like. You can inform them very, you know, according to you know, the best possible standards. But you could also be in a very different situation. You could have someone with an acute trauma who you know, becomes unconscious all of a sudden and then wakes up in a state where he is locked in. So then it's much more difficult, of course, to ensure um, he fully grasped the options and that he can really um, make an informed decision about them. So to respect users' autonomy, you need to shape, you need to shape informed consent and decision-making processes accordingly. And this can be, it sounds like obvious, but this can be, if you want to do this in practice, can be quite a, um, quite a complex task and quite a, a goal to achieve. Now let's briefly look at a second example, this time from a research setting. Assume there is this great new technology that allows individuals with dysarthria, a common motor speech disorder that is common in cerebral palsy, to be much better understood. Researchers then need individuals to test their devices to ensure its efficiency and safety. And they may find that the speech recognition device significantly increases the social inclusion and autonomy of individuals with cerebral palsy. Will then the participants be able to maintain access to the device after the research trial? This is a classic question, the post-benefit, um, post-trial benefit discussion. You know, because if you withdraw such a tool, then this can be distressful and frustrating. We may say, this was only an experimental setting, we just have to make this go through medical device regulation, you can't have it. So, and this might be something that's quite frustrating to the, the person who helped, yeah, who participated in the research. And depending on the technology, access may be difficult to maintain because of ongoing cost or um, risk management. 
So let's now move on from theoretical considerations to um, real life. You see here there was uh, is a, a, an award that was given in, in Switzerland, the One Show Award, and at the intro to this award states that about 22 people, um, percent of people in Switzerland live with disabilities, yet only one of the 200 members in the national parliament was a, is a person um, with a disability, and Islam Alije, whom we see here to the left, ran in the 23 elections to finally change that, or as he put it, I don't want to put my children, want my children to grow up in a society where their own father is seen as inferior. And I'd love to play this video and let's see if we manage to do that. People with disabilities need care and help. What the fuck? People with disabilities need a voice. This is my story of how I was elected to the National Council of Switzerland. As a child, I was considered mentally disabled because of my speech impediment. I want to study economics, but one of my teachers convinced my friends that the risk of paying on the job market was for the great. At that moment, I realized that I had to get in the police to change the system. But there were many obstacles. My party didn't believe that someone like me could be elected. I was given a hopeless place on the party list. And when you're in a wheelchair and can speak public, cabin is almost impossible. We had to do things differently. No messaging that was to evoke pity, no wheelchair. Using AI to show skeptics my intelligence and ideas. Using AI to show skeptics my intelligence and ideas. No corporate charity but crowdfunding. Not an election campaign, but a whole movement of people with and without disabilities. The impossible became reality. The Islam Aliyah. Also, die Wahl ist historisch. Islam Aliyah. Das ist der Islam Aliyah. Sondern er ist wirklich so ein bisschen aus dem Nichts gekommen. Here I am. And this is just the beginning. So, yeah, I think, I think it's truly impressive. And I think, you know, when he got voted into parliament, this was all over the media in Switzerland. So an AI avatar that enables politicians with a speech impairment to talk to voters can in fact strengthen democratic discourse. But the same technology can be used to produce male um, malevolent deep fakes that run counter to our democratic culture. And um, here you see that this happens too. Deep fakes of politicians around the world are used to make them say outrageous or absurd things. And sometimes that's meant as a joke, but the intention can, of course, also be to damage someone's reputation or to mislead voters. Unfortunately, there's also this recent example from Switzerland. A politician disseminated a deep fake in which a colleague from the opposing Green Party appeared to encourage votes for the other side, calling for the expulsion of migrant offenders, which quite contradicts the Green position. And this politician here argued that this was just a joke and anybody would recognize this is not real, but he ended up having to pay a fine and the judge ordered the video to be removed from the internet. Plus, the Swiss Parliament is considering a law on deepfakes, which shows how that this matter is taken very seriously. Now, before I close, let me address another concern that's related to cultural and linguistic sensitivity. And that's an issue that's of particular importance for Switzerland because um, we have not only four official languages, but a population of which almost one fourth is a native of still another language. So researchers have pointed out that LLMs, large language models such as ChatGPT, may threaten language diversity as standard American English or British English are usually considered as formal and professional compared to other English forms such as Black English. 
Similarly, Swiss German is not the standard language in ChatGPT when writing in German. The use of LLMs in AAC can thus marginalize users from non-dominant language groups or cultures. However, using, people using AAC should be able to use the words that reflect their identity. And a second point, cultural norms may encourage censoring the use of certain ver words such as swearing. You know, a lot of, I guess, Netflix series from the US and whenever there's fuck, there, you know, there's the F word. And however, in AAC, individuals may want to be free to choose to swear, especially when they are adults because it limits their autonomy and infantilizes them. So I think, you know, the question of can I fully express myself might be reduced by those mechanisms. So I think it's important to co-design AACs together with users because that can help pay due attention to issues of identity and autonomy, can help avoid paternalism. So not in, for instance, not including swear words in vocabulary. It can improve content quality through rapid user feedback and therefore reduce the risk of non-use. It can avoid the loss of time um, users would need to spend correcting incorrect words or sentence predictions and it can help to maintain speech authenticity. So we see that I think co-design to respect autonomy and identity is crucial. In conclusion, um, I think we can say the diversity of AAC technologies and users is quite you know, amazing, but there are common concerns and benefits that however vary in intensity. Um, there is, of course, in, like in so many other instances, the, the risk of dual use of the technology. You'll use in that case in the sense of, you know, for good or bad. And that's a challenge that should not hinder the inclusive innovation, but we should, of course, try to mitigate risks. The facilitation of speech should not come at the cost of compromised cultural identity, nor reduce speech expression. Co-design and user agency are critical. And a caveat in the end, health conditions may sometimes be used to create broader acceptance for technologies such as BCIs. We started with this really touching use case, but then we may branch out to enhancement technologies and really branch out to the healthy, something that was discussed at this symposium yesterday. So there is definitely a need for continuous critical assessment of technological innovation and its regulatory implications. And I'd like to finish thanking particularly Ariane Perez, who is the PhD candidate at my institute, who provided research assistance in a field that I didn't know that well, but she wrote her PhD on it. Um, I'd like to really thank individuals with disabilities like Tristram Ingham or Islam Aliyai, whose dedication and engagement for a better future is truly inspirational. The organizers for taking up this important topic and all of you for your interest and attention. Thank you.